I'm yep. assuming no news is good news. But yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, just to kind of put some um, kind of bones on that. So I started Small 99 probably about two years ago now, a bit less than. Really is this idea of, you know, micro and small businesses make up 99% of the economy, but they're really being left behind by a lot of the advice out there, which is still even now quite academic or really speaking to the wrong audience. So we typically focus on companies that have got less than 20 employees. So anyone from, you know, a solo founder or a freelancer all the way up to 20 employees is sort of our sweet spot of people who can take action really quickly, make the changes they need, and therefore uh, respond to the legislative and incoming changes that are, are happening. Um, so we run a series of events called People Planet Point, which happen in about 40 cities across the UK to get people together and just talk about sustainability over a point. Uh, we also have a carbon reduction kind of platform where if you log in and sign up, then we'll have a list of things you can do to get to net zero. And you'll see some examples of that later as we kind of run through some of those practical steps of what carbon reduction looks like. In terms of today's session, what I really wanted to do is, is take quite a top level overview. So some of this you might already know, some of it you might not, but I really wanted to set the scene of what sustainability means with a view of, okay, well, what does it look like? How do you start measuring it? And what does that, that kind of process of, of carbon measurement look like? Because what is coming is a lot more demands around the measurement side, but also around the action side and some of the legislation there. Full caveat, you probably do know more about the legislation side than I do, so I'm willing to take kind of corrections, questions or responses on that. It'd be really handy for me to understand the, well, I'm really interested to hear the, the kind of day-to-day -day pressures that you're hearing and to a certain extent why you're in this call at all, um, because it's stuff that I'm seeing at the broader level, so we, we don't really focus on a specific industry, we're quite agnostic, but we are starting to see different things pop up from different groups. I'll also look at um, what your carbon footprint looks like as a, as a slightly more tangible way to start analysing your, your internal uh, footprint and start preparing for that net zero legislation and some ideas of where to act. And then ideally, we'll finish up in about 30 minutes um, with some Q&A at the end. So please do pop any questions in the chat. I'll then come to those at the end or um, I'll be stopped halfway through and then we can, we can tackle them if, if we think it's correct. Um, so just to give a bit of an overview of what that sustainability really means. And I think carbon neutral is this term that's existed for quite a while now. People are quite uh, kind of happy with it. But really, it's, the, it's quite a confusing one because it is very different to what net zero means. So carbon neutral is a term where we would measure your footprint and maybe your organization has got a footprint of 100 tons. And then to become carbon neutral, we would need to purchase those offsets equivalent to uh, the, the 100 tons of emissions. Now, sometimes this can mean all greenhouse gases, sometimes it does just mean carbon, i.e. carbon dioxide, and therefore it is quite limited in its view of what the uh, emissions of your footprint would look like in measuring those 100 tonnes. But the key thing here really is that it is mostly about uh, offsets and it doesn't require reduction. And this is why the language has really moved away from carbon neutral as being the standard, because it is a little bit too passive in, in, in its kind of ability. And the way I always think of it is, is throwing money at the problem. doesn't mean it's a bad thing to do, and it's certainly a great stepping, kind of stepping point on your sustainability journey, but it's not the, the end destination. It's something you might have to do, and you can do very quickly before you start looking at your net zero in more detail. The main certification out there for carbon neutrality is PAS 2060, and there are various organisations that will help you achieve that, and typically that can be done uh, quickly through verified offsets. I'm not going to go into offsets too much because that's a whole separate two-hour webinar that I can dive into of what trees are the right ones and all that jazz. The difference between carbon neutral and net zero is that, well, one net zero always includes all greenhouse gases. So that's your carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and then fluorinated gases. So if you think of an air conditioning unit or a refrigerator, that will have F gases in it that are, are used, and they are a lot more potent in terms of greenhouse warming potential than carbon dioxide and therefore there is a big focus on those F gases if you're in a um, industry that affects that. The main thing with net zero though is that if you do have a footprint of 100 tonnes, in order to reach net zero, you need to reduce your emissions down to just 10 tonnes. So this is where the action comes in and why net zero is a far more ambitious level of um, kind of target or, or, or direction. Is, is you need to start doing stuff, you need to start making changes within your operational uh, kind of day-to-day -day operations within your business in order to achieve that. 
It also includes a lot more sources. So carbon neutral does tend to only um, impact on scopes one and two, and I'll come on to define that shortly. But with net zero, it does look at your entire emissions. So your direct emissions, i.e. your operational, but also your indirect. So your supply chain and who are you buying from? And this is where a lot of the, the changes that are coming are starting to impact on smaller businesses, is that there's no legislation that is necessarily directing you as a small freelancer individually. However, if you're going for a tender with a larger organization, well, you are suddenly part of their emissions and that they are going to have to start measuring your footprint to understand their own footprint. And therefore, if you're not taking action, you might be deselected as part of that. And we are starting to see that with companies such as Tesco and the NHS are actually starting to do that as of next year. So this is where not being net zero is becoming a competitive disadvantage. In terms of that journey and what it looks like, this is the classic um, three-stage process that everyone talks about, is that you measure your footprint, you calculate your total emissions and identify it, you then start reducing your actions down over a series of years, and then you offset at the end what's left. Uh, that does sort of work for large corporates. I think it's mostly bullshit for smaller businesses. The reality is that you're going to be doing all at once because you can move so much quicker as a smaller organization that you might start reducing in the first sense. And that might be as small as changing your packaging supplier. It might be you've got an EV. It might be you're you know, installing solar panels. You're probably then going to get curious about what impacts that had, that has had. And then you might start looking at measuring those impacts at the same time. And then you might also be looking at offsetting through local schemes because you want to help fund tree planting with your local school, or you might want to restore some local kind of peatland or whatever it might be. It's a much messier journey for smaller businesses, but I think that's the powerful thing is that it means that you can tell a much greater story with it because you can do everything all at once. And that measurement piece if you really want to, you can go away and do it relatively quickly and relatively cheaply on your own, or you can get a consultant in to do it. Um, and it's a bit of work, a bit of data gathering, and it can, you know, you can you can achieve it. Um, but some people don't really want to, and I think that's also fine because it might be that you're going to do that next year and that this year you just want to focus on action. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer really on this kind of dial of where you start. You can do whatever as long as you're doing something, that is the main thing. In terms of how you measure those scopes, um, so net zero, you've got your scope one emissions, which is your vehicles and your gas very broadly. So any owned vehicles in the business, if you've got a van that's doing deliveries, that is scope one, any gas being burned on site. So um, heating or any kind of, um, what's the word, machinery. If you've got a coffee roasting machine, for example, that would be scope one. Um, scope two would be your, your electricity. It's much simpler. It's pretty much that. And then scope three is a big one. And that's where the, a lot of the challenges are coming in that it's everything that you buy, sell or throw away. So if you think of your entire supply chain and the end of use of any products that you're making and or selling or the services that you're making or selling, that is your scope three emissions. So as an example, for me, that is mostly going to be my like train travel. It's going to be my digital emissions from the tools that we're building and the website traffic that we're getting. It's you know the advice that I'm giving and how that's impacting on clients. So it's quite it's a really big one. And we'll come on to define that a bit more in more detail later. This is the industry standard. It's the greenhouse gas protocol. This is the sort of net zero definition that is still being refined, but is is the kind of the gold standard there. Typically, this is what your footprint will look like, no matter your organization, um, unless you're doing some very unusual and very specific things. Your scope one and two are going to be relatively minimal. The only difference here would be something like a haulage company. If you know, you know, whether they own a massive fleet of quite highly polluting vehicles, your scope one would be bigger. But even then, your scope three is going to be at least ninety percent of your emissions. I would say, and is the one that is more difficult to start measuring. However, is also not required to be measured. Slightly broken animation there. Um, it does that legislation that's coming through. It's really requiring scope one and two, and, and there's there's a few different fun buzzwords here so you've got the and i always get this wrong but i think it's a standardized energy and carbon reporting framework that typically hits companies that have got more than 36 million pounds in turnover but essentially requires you to measure your scopes one and two and easy bits with your scope three and by easy bits it i basically mean your business travel um, and any kind of transport related emissions tcfd the task force for climate related financial disclosures uh, is a much bigger piece of, uh, of, of legislation that's hitting banks and kind of pension funds and things like that, that's really ratcheting up the, the need to demonstrate action within their, their smaller business audience. And then finally, SBTI, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, 
that's an international scheme that verifies that the net zero pathways for um, certain corporations are basically valid and, and ambitious. Again, someone like Tesco's would be the one that's getting SBTI. I wouldn't recommend it for, for smaller businesses. And I imagine if everyone on this call has got less than 100 employees, I probably wouldn't bother with it. Um, yeah, just in a bit more detail, scope, scope one is your gas emissions and your owned vehicle emissions. Your data sources for that, if you did want to start measuring it, is going to be your, your gas bills, your energy bills, the amount of miles driven in your vehicles or the amount of fuel that you've consumed in your vehicles. And again, these are owned vehicles by the business. So if you can gather that data up, you can quite quickly start estimating and measuring your scope one. Scope two, quite simply, energy bills. Uh, I'm sure we'll see them, especially over the past year. So if you've got 20,000 kilowatt hours of, of usage, there's a, 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 a metric that you measure that by. I believe it's 0 0.192 from memory for electricity in terms of the emissions equivalent. Uh, and that will give you your footprint. And that, that figure has been reducing kind of every year as we install more wind and solar capacity onto the grid in the UK. Scope three. Now, this is where it gets a little bit more uh, fun, shall we say, or, or kind of challenging, in that your upstream kind of the, your scope three is going to split into 15 different subcategories, of which there are two different uh, kind of broader categories, which is your upstream and your downstream. So your upstream scope three emissions are your purchase goods and services, capital goods, fuel and energy usage, uh, transport and distribution, waste generated in company operations uh, and business travel and employee commuting. And I think visitor travel as well um, and upstream leased assets. So we'll come on to the easy ones that I'd focus on here. I wouldn't say that you need to measure all of scope three immediately. This is a destination, not a, uh, a requirement at this stage. Downstream, you've got your uh, transport and distribution, processing of sold goods, end of use of sold goods, which is one that often gets missed out. So think of an e-commerce company selling pens. What happens at the end of life of that pen? Does it get thrown in the bin? Does it go into you know the garden and get recycled into an eco thing? Or, or what happens with it? Um, that's the, the impact of, of where we're going in, in that you need to have that full life cycle view of your products. Waste disposal and treatment of products, and then downstream leased assets, operation of franchises, and operation of investment. So things like pension funds would come into that last uh, investment element and can be a big part of your footprint. Now, all that sounds quite scary. These are the ones that I would, the animations aren't meant to go on this slide, apologies. Um, these, this is what it, I would start, recommend you start with in terms of your scope three. If you can start demonstrating that you're thinking about these different areas, you are probably going to be ahead of your competition in terms of measurement, because most people at the minute are still grappling with measuring their scope one and two, which for small businesses can be done very quickly. Waste generated in company operations, can you start weighing how much you know, recycling you're throwing out, how much glass you're producing, how much waste material on site is being produced? Business travel, fairly straightforward, how much are you traveling for work? Employee commuting, again, a basic survey can get that data quite quickly and, the, and there's calculators out there which will um, throw it together fairly simply as well. Those are the most relevant ones. Um, purchase goods and services, there are calculators out there that will estimate based on spend for you. That's a good starting point. Is, isn't, it has its issues with it and we'll come on to some of the weaknesses later. Um, and transport distribution, again, if you do have the ability to track how many miles your hauliers or your um, kind of cargo partners are, are doing, that will be helpful. I've just seen two comments in chat. Cool. Good. No, no, uh, no questions so far. Um, key areas. So the problem with your footprint is scope one and two is incredibly boring and dull language to explore. It's very technical and ultimately no one really cares about it apart from carbon consultants. So I think the, the, the way that we want to actually break it up is that your operation, operational emissions will, will split into five key areas. You've got energy and buildings, you've got transport, you've got water, you've got your supply chain, and you've got waste. The reason why I include water in this is that it's not going to be a huge part of your footprint, but it is going to be a resource that is increasingly uh, kind of restricted over the next decade, and therefore starting to implement water saving things is going to save you a lot of money and going to save you a lot of impact too. Uh, you know, it's going to future proof your business slightly more. Energy and buildings. These are the main uh, sources of your emissions. So you've got air conditionings and cooling, lighting, heating, devices and machinery, and any kind of cooking that you're doing on site. Um, 
transport, staff commuting, business travel, own vehicles, subcontractors, subcontractors being quite a big one there, uh, visitor miles as well. So if you do run like a campsite or a hotel that might be in, in you know the countryside, it will come, come to a point where your footprint includes visitor travel to those sites. I think it was IKEA measured this and they found that 25% yeah, of their entire operational footprint was from people traveling to the, the premises, to the, to the out of store, out of town retail units. Supply chain is the big one. So it's everything you buy and sell, as mentioned before. Any products that you're producing and selling and how they're thrown away. Really anything you spend money on, that includes packaging, promotional materials, et cetera. Also includes services. So if you've got an accountant or you've got any marketing people that you're working with, their emissions will start coming into play here as well. So it is worth starting to engage them and ask them for their um, net zero policy as well. If you don't, then someone else will in the next kind of year or so. Waste, again, fairly obvious. I think waste is the most visible within our emissions so raw materials and processed goods water toilets cleaning kind of washing machines any 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 kind of water or processing and industrial processes that you are using is going to be a big one as well um but again water it, it's not a huge footprint but it is a resource that is going to be tracked more and more in the next kind of few years especially in the southeast where we're seeing already droughts um this winter that are persisting so expect that to be a much bigger uh intangible thing to start tracking anyway where to start so where do you actually start with measurement and what does that look like i'm just going to run through a quick example of how you can start measuring your footprint to break it down it is it can be quite simple this isn't uh measuring your entire footprint is very difficult measuring part of your footprint and getting started is very easy so there are places you can start the key thing really is that this is a scale I imagine most people are around 0% in the minute where you've not started measuring, or maybe you've started measuring a few things, but you, you don't, you know, you've got a rough idea. There's a lot of general guidance out there. So this is sort of where Small 99 sits. We provide a lot of industry agnostic uh, guidance and advice on how you can start reducing your footprint and how you can start, uh, yeah, what actions you can take on that and what your footprint might look like. As an example, we're currently building a calculator that will be a carbon footprint estimator for small businesses where based on the amount of employees you've got in your industry, that's all the information we, to a certain extent, need to give you a rough ballpark of what your footprint probably is. It's not going to be accurate, but it does get you some of the way there to then start refining it down. And then at that point, you then might move over to spend-based measurement. So there are, again, there are calculators out there that will take your accounts data and based on some averages and some maths, give you a rough figure of what your footprint is based on spend. The danger there is, is that you can only reduce that by spending less money over time. So there is a weakness to that, that kind of spend-based method, but it is very quick and easy to do. It will take you probably an hour or two to plug in your data and, and kind of build out from there. And then finally, you've got activity-based. And activity-based is really where a lot of the consultancies operate in that they will come in and they'll measure everything that you do and everything that you're, you know, how many miles you've driven rather than how much money you've spent on petrol as an example, to really understand what the, the kind of activities look like, even that is not going to be 100% accurate because the data simply isn't there at the, the kind of national level to get 100% accuracy on footprint. Um, Adam, David's yes. asked a question. David, did you want to come off mute and ask it, or should we just, um, did you want to expand on your question? Sorry, Adam. Can you hear me? Could you mean Yeah, we me? can. Cheers, David. I didn't okay. mean to interrupt. This was no, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's quite it's quite nice to just to uh, um um answer any questions as they come up. If if they're relevant, we're in a situation where I think that question probably does make sense. Yeah, sorry, there are two questions basically. Um I missed the beginning, so you may have said this. Um these are kind of um moral or whatever you call it, requirements. Yeah. So will any of the, is there a knowledge of any of this being made a legal requirement? That's one thing at a time scale. And two, um, so that's the first question. The second one is there's a business, there's an ethical investment kind of need for businesses. So they have to show uh, this is an ethical thing. Um, which is primarily driven by BlackRock with their ESG requirements. Um, so that's two questions. One is a legal 
is there going to be, uh, has anything been said about this becoming a legal requirement to operate a business? And secondly, uh, notwithstanding that some ethical institutional clients might want to know that. Um, <laughs> and secondly, um, are there any other requirements that might, are any other bases for this being done <laughs> other than BlackRock CSG requirement, which is basically intended to drive business, small businesses out of the market and only have big businesses, you uh, could say. How, how big is your business, David? Uh, four people. Four people, yeah. Okay, so in terms of the first question, which is the slightly easier one to answer, I think, in terms of when it will become a legal requirement, um, for you directly, not for a while, uh, there's not going to be a legal requirement for small businesses to can report on their carbon footprint to like the government or councils that I know of anytime soon. What we are seeing though, is that because there is legislation that is hitting slightly larger organizations. So you might've missed the, the slide where we mentioned it very quickly. Yeah, the, I did, I'm sorry. No, no, don't, don't worry. Um, it's like the standardized energy and carbon reporting mechanism, which requires businesses above about 36 million pounds in turnover to measure their scopes one and two. And the other one that I mentioned that I can't remember, but yeah, the, the, there is legislation that's starting to hit them and, and that's starting to hit organizations that are much larger, but the result of that is that then they are requiring their entire supply chain to start having these um, net zero alignments or have measured their footprint in some way. So that's where it's thought of, manif it's, that's where it's manifesting is it's not necessarily in a direct neat piece of legislation that's hitting you, it's hitting the people that you're working with who are then coming to you and saying, well, actually, we need this. A quick example of that would be someone like um, Scottish Enterprise, because I'm based in Glasgow. So Scottish Enterprise are a business support agency. For any funding more than £10,000 in terms of grants or um, kind of loans or investments, to work with them and for them to provide you with that funding, you need to have a net zero strategy or commit to have one within 12 months. And we're already six months into that. So... We're now seeing that within 12 months, there is a requirement that you don't legally need a net zero policy, but in order to access funding or to access supply chains such as the NHS, you will need to have a net zero policy. So basically, if there's a big organisation that falls into that category, and if you want to work for them, you by default get sucked into that category as a provider to them. Yeah, correct. Yeah, that's a yeah. much simpler way of saying it yeah. than, what I, than how I did. Yeah, perfect. Um, so it's creeping like the energy certificates were. They would initially just do your energy certificate, but you don't have to do anything. Whereas now, if you're a landlord, you have to bring your property up to a certain standard. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of the same kind of creeping approach, I suppose. Um, I would say it's, it's also, I wouldn't say it's creeping. I think what we're hearing from a lot of kind of support organisations, I had a call with Scottish Enterprise recently, and they were saying that a lot of their... Uh, most people who are going to them are businesses that are, you know, 30 or 40 people who are smaller and they thought they wouldn't get hit by this and they're being asked for it before they lose a contract in the next two months. Yeah. And, it, and it's it's really that that kind of time scale. Yeah, that's very that's made it very clear. Thank you. Cool. So I won't post the second question because you answered. Oh, <laughs> no, so, yeah. Uh, ethical investment need for businesses. Sorry, apologies. Um, the BlackRock stuff. I think the SG question is a big one and I think that's probably... I don't have enough information to answer that comprehensively now. I think with the investments, the, my main kind of advice is start looking at where you're banking and start looking at where your pensions are, because that is going to be a big way to start reducing your kind of carbon footprint down quite significantly. If you're heavily invested in Shell, don't be, and that will have, have a fairly kind of big impact as an example. Um, the ESG thing, I, I don't really know what ESG kind of stands for means. I think it's quite a vague term and, it does come into this kind of greenwashing a little bit from larger corporates, which is why I think I'm always a big fan. And I'm not saying necessarily I'm right in this, but I do prefer net zero because it is a more defined journey and a more defined action orientated kind of goal. Whereas I think some of the biggest ESG, almost well um, scoring ESG companies in the world are, as you say, people like BlackRock who are not exactly the most ethical or low carbon businesses. So yeah, ESG is a big, a big kind of, topic grenade so i'm going to try and avoid it if possible um i'm just going to move on but thanks david for the, the questions yeah, there. okay in terms of measurement i think the key thing as you start on that journey is that your footprint is going to go up because you're going to add in more data so the more data you gather the more accurate your footprint is but the more data you're gathering and the more accurate your footprint is the more footprint you're going to have 
you are going to be filling in gaps as you go with this. There is not a requirement for you to measure scopes one, two, and three in full immediately. No one has done this. Even the bigger kind of corporates will have certain areas of scope three that they've excluded from this. Really, the, the key things are that energy and transport are quite easy to, to calculate because it's very data driven. Um, so if you start small, just think of a journey that you do commuting into the office every day. That's then very easy based on some simple maths to get a footprint for and scale that up. As an example, a Ford Focus has got a carbon footprint per mile of 276 grams. And therefore, if you're doing 7,000 miles a year in that, times those two together, and you get a footprint of about two tons or 1,932 kilo, kilo, kilograms. So that's an assumption that I can say, well, actually, the average mileage in the UK is about 7,000 miles, I think, at the minute. It, you know, it was 9,000 a few years ago, but trends have dropped as we've gone to work from home. Therefore, per employee who's driving a Ford Focus into work, if they're doing that five days a week, it's probably around um, two tons per employee. And so you can start getting very rough ideas very quickly there. Similarly, with business travel, you see something like this, where this is a trip I did recently, where I went from Brighton to Edinburgh, um, uh, kind of via London, Eastbourne, Southampton, and back down to Brighton again. It was a bit of a messy journey, but I traveled about 1,400 miles over that time by train. And there's a simple figure, which is 0 0.05 kilos per mile, times that by you know, the two figures together, 72 kilos. That's my business travel done. So the challenge there is more in gathering the data of all those journeys and, and what you've done. And the sooner you can start doing that, the easier. Adam, on, on the trains, yeah. the, the base, you know, the um, zero, the 0 0.05 kilograms CO2 per mile, is that based on the train running empty, full, half full? How, how, <clears throat> it's always intrigued by the, trying to measure the train journeys. Yeah, so, so the government greenhouse gas emissions factors go into this in a bit more detail. And it, that's, the, that's the figure that I'm using there, which is from Bayes. It's an average across the UK. So that's including things like the diesel trains that might be running in the Midlands, um, or kind of the north. The Brighton to London line is electrified. So in theory, that route would actually be a lot lower than that. And, and as you say, it's not going to be running at 100% capacity at all times. So it will take an average for that capacity as it does with the same with buses as well is it takes an average for an inside of london and outside of london occupancy level and it's done per passenger kilometer rather than per mile of transport so for example if there was two of two of me two of us traveling that figure would double whereas the car would stay the same so there are journeys where taking a car will be lower carbon than the train because if you've got a car with five people in it it can become lower emissions so that's where you're going to get into the weeds a bit and you know getting it accurate is quite difficult but getting a rough idea is is fairly quick um in terms of that building the data up over time this is really what you're going to look like so year one you might have a footprint where you've measured your gas and your electricity because that's data that you've got to hand in your energy bills and therefore can pull it out quite quickly year two you might then go gas and some some of the vehicles that you own in the business and you start working on your refrigerants um, and you might also add in base business travel and waste generated, and therefore your footprint's going to be slightly bigger. And then you're going to add in, you know, year three, you're going to have a much more comprehensive profile as you change your measurement approach and, and have all that data there. And as you can see here, if we put some figures to that year one, it might be 13 tons where you've got five and eight in gas. You then reduce down your gas usage. So your gas usage actually drops to five tons in year two, but you're measuring much more data and therefore your overall footprint does start to increase. So this is where it gets a little bit more complicated with that measurement journey is that you need to be very clear in defining what you've measured and when if you are trying to declare your net zero strategy, because if you're measuring scopes one, two and three um, in year three, but you're only measuring scope one in year one, obviously there's going to be a difference in data there. So just make sure that you're transparent in this. I think that's the key thing here. There's no gotcha moment other than just don't try and hide it. And that's my biggest frustration with a lot of corporates when they declare their net zero strategies is what they typically mean is there'll be an asterisk somewhere that says scopes one and two only included. And they're ignoring the fact like Ikea that, well, Ikea measured it, right? But 25% of their total footprint was just in customer vehicle miles to their locations. So, you know, th their decision to put those out of town is gonna have an impact on that footprint. And therefore they need to be aware of that. And if they're only measuring scopes one and two, then they'll ignore that. Anyway, soapbox over. Um, yeah, scope one and two is mostly the required reporting. Scope three is more voluntary, but I would recommend you start looking at it. Anyway, that's that drum 
Bank's death. Legislation, David, you mentioned this just now. So again, this is the slide where I'm, I'm willing to be corrected on because I'm not entirely sure. This is my best kind of my latest knowledge. It might be that there's um, things that have changed since then. But my understanding is that in by 2025, um, all rental properties need an EPC of C or above, and all commercial buildings will start to require an EPC as a base level. Quite rapidly, we start moving to 2027, where all commercial properties um, need an EPC with a minimum of C or above. And then 2030, it's all rental and commercial properties need B or above. So quite rapid ratcheting there of just the legislation for your industry. I wasn't sure, kind of either side with David, is, is this roughly what you're seeing? Is this roughly correct? There, I don't think it's the legislation's been passed yet, but this is this right. Is working towards. Yeah, it. it's quite interesting. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's very interesting because um, developers are obviously who are developing as rental landlords are currently targeting B, and mortgage lenders to those rental right. landlords. I'm talking about substantial developments here, not just one-off houses. Uh, we've encountered this. Uh, the mortgage lenders apply a high rate of interest to something that's currently being designed and targeted C than to something that's being designed and targeted B because they are obviously mitigating their risk yeah. in an, because they're the, the mortgage lender is actually the owner, not the landlord. So they're mitigating their risk of the value of downgrading the value of their property or having to upgrade it so it's kind of coming in from all sorts of directions the impetus to to kind of follow these in advance and you know when is it going to go beyond b because a building's lifetime is quite long its retrofit period might be 25 years so it's a there's a really funny one there the government cranks up again beyond you know to whatever a might be um, within 25 years, that landlord's got an, a, a, an upgrade ahead of his normal cycle for a um, lifetime recycle of the building. Yeah. So yeah, there's a, I think the way the government are doing this isn't isn't very good. It's um, it's not a, helpful once you go beyond these and you speculate. I think that's a good summary for most kind of net zero aligned government policy at the minute, to be honest, David. Um, <laughs> I think there's also the mortgage one is interesting because what we're starting to see tangentially, and I don't, you know, not in the industry as much, but starting to see some mortgage providers kind of building in climate risk to their their lending as well. So, are you in an area that is more likely to be flooded in the next five years, as an example, um, and and seeing modelling data come out for that based on postcode? It's still quite early days. That data is still a little bit rough and ready. Uh, and certainly I've, I've struggled to find accurate data for kind of what 1.52 or 4 degrees of warming looks like and the impacts on local areas. But, you know, already we I think it was Norfolk, we saw that there was a bunch of properties that were unmortgageable because they are going to be falling into the sea in the next two to 10 years based on how bad the storms are. So it's, this is something that is, is going to hit a lot of UK property owners much harder than I think they potentially realise in terms of climate change manifesting in physical changes more and more. Yeah, uh, that's existing property, um, new yeah. property, which requires town planning permission. That I think that's pretty much stitched up to be above flood levels or mit have mitigating measures for flood, um, whereas old properties, which is most of property, yeah, you just stuck with it and it's going to be a problem getting a mortgage. Yeah, I think the EPC one is interesting as well because like, I'm in a Glasgow tenement and, you know, we're probably EPC D, I reckon, because it's all made of sandstone. There's no way you can really insulate it without just building an internal box inside of it. And then that kind of causes extra problems based on my basic understanding. So, yeah, and I think there. I think there's there's going to be sorry, I'm extending the topic here. I'll shut up then. I think the retrofitting of properties to make them the envelope. Uh, more energy efficient is going to cause an unbelievable number of building defects because I don't think it's easily possible on a lot. Yeah. You know, the risks of interstitial condensation and all sorts of other problems are colossal. Um, and, and we're finding it now that there are lots of, lots of issues and of bad solutions and there aren't really any good solutions. So, yeah, I think there's a major problem, a major conflict here that the government aren't facing up to. Yeah. Especially I mean, when, 
especially when this goes out to little builders who don't know water runs downhill and, and <laughs> you know, cold causes condensation. Um, yeah, this drays on to another topic. We've got, we have a uh, Russell Smith and David Pierpoint speaking in a couple of weeks on the challenge of retrofitting. Um, and, you know, I only read an article in the FT today about planning and how none, none of it's aligned anyway. So even if people genuinely want to do the best they can to retrofit their older properties, they are, the planning process is broken. So, I mean, there's so, so many challenges, but in, 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 in terms of, yeah, so that, that, that's something that we welcome your thoughts on when David and Russell join. Yeah, sorry, us. I've gone off topic. No, 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 it's fine. No, it's good to, it's good, it's good to have the, it's good to have the discussion. And I can talk about this particular area all day because that's the area that, um, you yeah, know, I'm mostly familiar with. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's interesting from what Adam's saying. It's like some of the, being aware of all the changes that just the common sense changes as well that we can make in order to um, reduce reduce um, the impact of our small businesses and, and reduce the, the amount of emissions. Um, um, right. um, um, Adam, there was um, yes, Pablo's uh, question. Sorry, uh, there's been a bunch of uh, Pablo's asked a question as well in terms. Yeah. Of, can you see that? Is there a way to estimate a carbon footprint of the scopes when they're not capable of measuring them in the early stages? I think so. This is this is like the key thing that we're now currently we're in the middle of building it. So Pablo, if you're wanting to share your details, I'd like you to be a guinea pig for <laughs> once we've built that out, because there's not really anything on the market that I'm aware of. There's a huge amount of measurement based spend, like kind of a spend based measurement that is available, which is great and it is fast. So you've got Ecology Zero, you've got Sage Earth that will take that data and very quickly do it. However, that requires you to one, give up your accounts data and integrate it, and two, have accurate accounts data that is verified by an accountant to, to make sure that it's, you know, the, it, the categorizations are correct. Because if you've got £100,000 categorized as, I don't know, you know, accountancy spend rather than petrol spend or, or kind of business travel, then that's going to have a huge impact on, on that footprint. So what we're building out is a very simple yes no type calculator where based on some very broad assumptions we can give you a range of your footprint it's not designed to replace measurement but it is that finger in the air for people who aren't capable of measuring them in those early stages um yes richard um i'm not sure i wasn't sure if that was a question or a statement but it's correct question yeah yeah also nice to see you on, on the call richard also nice to see a friendly face um, so yeah, company cars are scope one, but then any kind of business travel or employee commuting tends to be scope three. And even then, it does get a little bit more complicated if you're owning the vehicle through a lease of the, if it's a personal vehicle, it's leased through the company. So this is why we I tend to try and advise based on estimating footprints based on categories rather than necessarily scopes if you don't need to, because defining the exact column that your scope one goes into becomes very difficult. However, just measuring a rough idea of we know that our transport footprint based on visitor emissions, commuting emissions and business travel is this is a much easier figure to come to. Um, it's not technically accurate, but it doesn't necessarily need to be because it's still more data than most people probably will have. And worst case, it will buy you a bit of time to then get a consultant in to verify it. So I think starting is really key here. And on that, we will come on to that. Seamlessly, but very quickly before we do, these are just the three kind of areas where we're seeing this come through. And I think David would kind of spoke to this already, but NHS, they're requiring all suppliers by April 2024 to have a net zero strategy in place. Um, Scottish Enterprise has mentioned all grants above £10,000 require a, uh, a net zero strategy attached to it. And Tesco's, again, all new and existing uh, suppliers require strategies. So that isn't to say they need to be net zero, obviously, because no company can be net zero right now, because if you use any electricity at all, that's going to have a footprint to it. So in net zero is a destination, it's something to work towards, but you can make very rapid reductions in your emissions. You know, I think as a business going to 90% reduction is near impossible, but 75% reduction is very easy in a lot of cases. Um, and we'll come on to some examples of what that looks like. Very easy might be overselling it, but depending on your business, there are quite rapid things that you can do to reduce it. In terms of energy and buildings, and I'm probably preaching to the choir will be correct on some of these, but you know we've got a survey that goes out and we've spoken to about 2,000 businesses in the past 12 months. 75% of those haven't done the full LED upgrades. Most of them have still got non-LED lighting in their premises somewhere. And that's a, a huge opportunity where that's an 80% reduction in energy usage immediately. 
Uh, solar panels obviously um, are great. They work. There's just a lot of questions around kind of grid capacity and installation there, but we are seeing a huge uptake there. Insulation, as, as David mentioned, is great, but can complicate things. Draft proofing is an obvious one for smaller businesses as well, if you can engage your landlord on that. Um, smart meters, again, smart meters are really good at just automating that data collection as well. However, if you can't do that, and if you do have a, a kind of a high energy business, using smart plugs can be a really easy way to go around and just identify individual energy consumption of different devices. So if you're running lathes or if you're running kind of big servers or anything like that, you want to get an idea of where that footprint is coming from, smart plugs are a great way of doing that. Um, Harry, have you seen your question? What can we do to our area of the building when we are a tenant in our building with a very unhelpful, neglectful landlord and management company? Um, this is the, the sad kind of question, really, that we do hear quite a lot. I would say the best thing to do is, one, educate your landlord, if possible, on the EPC ratings that are coming in and go legislation is coming. Two, contact your council and start engaging with them. Your like local chamber of commerce and council are very, very keen to hear of these stories because they are trying to get this stuff pushed through because of their own net zero commitments. And therefore, they are starting to, if not already, put more pressure on landlords as a result of that. That's the best advice I can give at the minute. It is very qualitative. There's not much of a big stick you can really point to or to force them. But um, the other option is then move premises. And that, I, you know, most businesses that I've spoken to who have achieved, who, who, have, who have encountered this issue, have ended up just moving to a net zero aligned premises instead, who are now oversubscribed and can't get enough staff. Uh, well, like, that's where space. the... Um... You know, when when the land um, lord or the management company has to refinance on that, assuming they don't, um, it's not unencumbered, and assuming there is some finance on it, that's what David was saying. That the finance companies companies will sort of indirectly insist that there are upgrades because otherwise, everyone's going to be penalised with higher with higher interest rates to actually own own that property. Yeah, obviously, it depends when that's going to happen. I think this is where we're starting to see the private sector lead a lot more. I think, you know, government policy is mostly ineffective at the minute. It's not ambitious enough. However, the private sector is starting to really fill that gap and legislation like TCFD or kind of you know, commitments like that are putting pressure on those bigger banks to then look at their mortgage portfolios and start doing the carbon footprint and risk analysis as a result. To counter that, I am a, a I do have a small portfolio of, of um, residential properties. It It is quite scary if legislation is not going far enough that the point of boots on the other foot you know the, the investment required is substantial to yep. get to a point where you are going to hit these targets um yeah very very substantial um and as what david was saying in terms of whether it's even possible for some of these properties but it's but well I, that's that's leading to for, sorry stop me if you want to carry on that's leading to uh, did anybody see what's he called? The guy who did the uh, on the team. Simon Reed did a fantastic program on Cornwall and what Cornwall's really like. And there was one thing that came out that lots of private landlords are selling up because of this, mm. um, and therefore the rental market is diminishing, and there are lots of people made homeless. So this is going to cause a lot of homelessness. Um, yeah. And that was fascinating, actually, uh, so, because people are getting out early before before this hits, yeah, before yeah. the value goes right down. Um, so it's not joined up thinking, and it is problematic, but that's not in our business sector, particularly that we're all involved in here, other than you as a landlord. I think um, there is a, there's a, there's a broader lack of that systems thinking um, within government legislation and, and everything already, I think, because if you look at something like the NHS, the health department is not necessarily talking to the net zero department to go, well, actually, what does air quality do to the budgets for the NHS and how can that save a bunch of cash um, yeah. through like kind of LE, uh, low emission zones or, you know, in public, not even that, but just better public transport will lower emissions and therefore save lives and reduce costs and burdens through reduced health problems. But there's not that conversation happening. So I think that, yeah, systems thinking is really what's key here. Um, I've only got a few slides left, so I'm just going to rattle through them and then come to questions at the end, if that's all right. Um, on the transport side, almost seamless segue there. Um, so things you can do with this, if you do have a site, then installing EV charging, uh, kind of business premises, and I'm thinking more commercial landlords here, is really key. 
Personally, I think that at home charging or like on street charging gets far too much attention when destination charging will solve a huge amount of the problems with electric vehicles. And even then, electric vehicles do have their own challenges, which I won't, it's a separate talk. Um, electric cargo bikes, really interesting one. I'm seeing a lot more businesses adopt these in urban areas. So coffee companies are starting to deliver a lot through them. We get quite a lot of our like Amazon or, you know, online orders um, come through electric cargo bikes now just because they're more they're quicker and cheaper to run and deliver faster than vans do so do look into those there is a company based in surrey who were a electrician team who replaced their transit vans with cargo bikes you know it, it can be done cycle schemes are a big one electric bikes are fantastic and it really do replace a lot of car journeys so do try and uh, offer those but also infrastructure um the like national trust i saw in the, the kind of the woody Articles this weekend are installing a massive new car park next to a cycle route, but they're not putting in any cycle storage whatsoever. So it's that sort of systems thinking as well and joined up thinking of going, if you are installing new infrastructure, who is it for? What are you doing? Because it might not be that everyone can afford a car. In Glasgow, I think it's 48% of people uh, don't have access to a car. So there's a huge population gap there where people assume um, car ownership is kind of by default where it might not actually be because it's outside of financial kind of ranges but that's a separate might not be relevant to this audience apologies offer one uh, engaging with council as well i think public transport's a massive one where you know i can sit here and, just, and give you all the data on how it will reduce your carbon emissions that doesn't really mean much if there's not a bus in your area that doesn't serve the industrial estate etc so do try and engage with the council and uh kind of demand that and feed that back to them if you are having troubles decarbonizing for that reason um, and domestic flights is a really big one. So this is where the big heavy reductions come from, is if you do travel from Glasgow to London, get the train rather than flying, it might take an extra hour or so, but you're going to see a big kind of saving there in terms of the carbon emissions. And we are entering a period where in the next five years, carbon taxes, again, for larger businesses are likely to start coming in. And therefore, you will start seeing um, that factored in financially as well. Again, there's a huge run there about why trains should be cheaper rather than flights but let's not go into that uh events i think really when you are if you are hosting any events do think about where you're hosting them as well are you hosting them as i went to one that was a net zero event um kind of end of last year in southampton that was in the is it the Aegis bowl kind of like a, a massive cricket ground just on the outside of town that i had to get a train a bus and a taxi to um, rather than hosting it somewhere in the city centre, uh, like the event actually I last saw Richard at, where I, you know, it was in the middle of Eastbourne and I could walk to it within about five minutes from the train station. So do think about your events and what impact that is having on those commuting and visitor emissions. Supply chain. Understand the impact of your decisions. I mean, every decision you make in your business is an environmental one. So start being more aware of that and just thinking at the back of your mind, what's the carbon footprint of this? There's a great database for the building industry called 2050 Materials. I'm not sure if you've come across it. I think it is free or it's got free access where you can look at the carbon footprint of any material. So if you are purchasing a bunch of XYZ, you can look at the, um, the footprint of it. Look at industrial leaders. So Lakers building merchants who are based in Sussex are really leading the way in terms of net zero. They've done a lot of stuff to engage with their suppliers and get all plastic packaging removed for carbon boxes for things like screws or nails or whatever it is. So it can be done. Just ask the question and start engaging. Um, it's really the biggest opportunity that is also going to be the biggest challenge. And I think it is that start small, just start the conversations and get going. You're not going to fix it overnight. You don't need to. Showing that you're engaged with it is going to put you far ahead of the competition. Um, and fundamentally, you're making other people's problem go away in that they're going to have the same problems with scope three and, and their supply chain. And therefore, if you can work with them to go, look, here's a list of things that you can do that would help us. It's going to probably help them as well. Um, waste. Minimize it, track it, reuse it where possible. There's an example we heard of Glasgow School of Art were throwing away about £15,000 worth of wood that they'd kind of ripped out from one of the installations. And it was like, well, that needs to be reused. Recycling that isn't going to be good enough. So how can you start working with people in your area to, to connect up with that? Recycling really should be the last option. If if I ask anybody and what they're doing around sustainability and they say recycling, um, I sort of think that's about 20 years out of date at this point. We we'll, we'll kind of be on that. We need to be doing far more. So I'm more interested to think, how are you reusing the boxes? One of the courses we went on, John Lewis were looking at this because um, well, they came on the kind of course, sorry. You know, if you imagine just your local Tesco's, Waitrose, John Lewis store, how many cardboard boxes are getting through a day? 
Um, and then how many boxes are being made for removal companies in that same city? Well, surely there's a natural fit there where those cardboard boxes that are quite strong can be reused. Does it really matter if your removal box has got the John Lewis branding on it? Probably not. Interestingly, I did get something. Um, one of our neighbours actually had a parcel delivered that had a, 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 bo- a, a label on the side of the box saying, um, you know, pl- I don't know what word it was, but it was like, you know, this box is reused, sorry if it's a bit dented. And that was a John Lewis thing where clearly they're reusing their own packaging rather than getting new stuff printed. So reuse is really the name of the game rather than recycling. Water, um, I've said about it already, just, you know, look at water saving devices, rainwater harvesting systems, uh, do regular maintenance on your kind of items, if not for the sake of saving the water, saving the cash, because a leak is, you know, if a leak happens, it's going to cost you money. Um, and rainwater harvesting can be useful for kind of grey water applications, such as cleaning vans, where you don't need to have tap water. The main thing in terms of what you're going to do this afternoon after this webinar, once I've stopped kind of trans- transmitting at you, is write a page, really understand, and, and just sit down and write down all the things in those five areas that you have done, that you are working on, that you are doing. Are you looking to electric vehicles? Is it on your roadmap once your current thing expires? Great, write that down in your doing thing. And then what are you going to do later? Things like, um, you know, Harry mentioned about engaging your landlords. Maybe you're looking at either engaging your landlord or finding a different premises as a result of that. Once you've got those things out, that is then your sustainability and your net zero policy. It does not need to be more complicated than that at this stage. Just the things that you have already achieved and already done, LEDs, solar panels, things that you're doing that might be electric vehicles or engaging suppliers, things like do later, moving offices because you can't do anything. That transparency is really key in what we need in this space to accelerate. Quick summary, just before I kind of stop. So one, start measuring small parts of your business to build up knowledge. It could be a really helpful way for you just to understand the impacts and where your footprint lies and will just get you a bit more carbon literate. Um, take reduction actions immediately. Don't wait for that measurement. I think just start doing things where you can. LED light bulbs and stuff like that. I know we keep banging on about them, but they do help and it does count towards the net zero strategy. Uh, and then finally, plan for the opportunity. There's a, a huge amount of kind of alignment here that is, is kind of happening within the economy and will happen over the next five years. We're having this net zero strategy to hand, even if it's a bit kind of loose as a document, we'll put you ahead of competition. Um, and help you win more business, both short term and long term. And that is it from me. Very conscious of time. <laughs> That's perfect for time. We've had a lot of interaction questions during the call, anyway. So you know we're, we're nearly we're nearly on the hour. So thank thanks for that, Adam. Really really useful. Thanks for everyone else for contributing. Yeah, it, it, big challenge. I like the way that you know we're being encouraged to take small steps and start and start now and we're not all expected to solve this this problem um it's a combination of you know obviously change of behavior that's required um that we all need to undertake aside from any government into not interference, the wrong word but reg- regulations and any any stick waving so a, a lot of what you said is just common sense anyway it's yeah. it's just you know the idea of reusing is just it's what people need to start doing and it, and it's easy, it's easily done i mean why do you go to a supermarket and spend 50p buying a blimmin shopping bag when you've got a box there i mean it's just it's just bloody stupid um, it is but i think a lot of people don't realize that that kind of common sense stuff is 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 your is is is, a, is helping is, is helping reduce that footprint down or actions that count towards that so uh, we spend a lot of time just trying to eke out this small businesses that kind of green washing green hushing element where people have done a lot of stuff already but they're not talking about it that's yeah. almost the biggest barrier for a lot of small businesses no absolutely and to add um to harry's point i i, I will i have shared at the top of the chat and i will upload it to uh, meshwork specifically f- um what other architectural practice are doing mm-hmm. um with um Stephen george there's a whole host of things that um adam touched upon and um Simon's post goes even further. I actually there's some really, really, really good suggestions, regardless of whether you're in architectural practice or or, or any office operating. There's 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 lots of good ways to cut down on your energy usage and you know, picking up on some of Adam's points around um 
travel sharing cars meeting up less meeting actually working when you do a site visit then you spend the day there and you work from there loads 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 of good suggestions as well um so thank you very much adam i'll um post i posted your link to um small 99 okay. chat i'll do so within mesh work any any questions i'm sure adam would like to hear from you following up um so yeah please please do that and um yeah thanks once again for your time mate it's very well, very helpful no, i appreciate it i hope it was interesting and useful for everybody um as that kind of slightly bigger scene setting um please do add me on linkedin as well i'll just put my thing in the chat and yeah, yeah any questions let me know because it's always good to hear from people in different industries and what's going on um because it can feel like i'm in a bubble sometimes so always <laughs> willing to be challenged and hear the, you know, the challenges that you're facing yeah no thank you very much indeed and yeah thanks all um and um, yeah keep an eye out on the events page um we got another event another webinar next week as always so uh speak to you soon cheers guys cheers see you all soon bye, bye. You're awesome. cheers adam cheers